Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from today. And welcome to today's webinar titled Building a Healthy Corner Store Network. I'm Renaris, and I'm a project on the National Campaign for Healthy Food Access here at the Food Trusts. I have the great fortune of moderating the webinar today with a wonderful panel of presenters. Before I get to that, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping notes. If you have any technical questions or problems during the webinar, please use the chat function and someone will assist you. Or if you have a question that you'd like to ask a specific speaker or the entire panel, please feel free to submit them using the question feature at any point during the webinar. And at the end, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can get to. As a reminder, the webinar will be recorded and an archive will be made available online. You'll receive a link to the archive following the completion of this webinar. And just to give a little background, the Healthy Food Access Portal is a partnership between PolicyLink, the Food Trust, and the Reinvestment Fund, and is made possible by the generous support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And together, we work to promote and increase equitable access to healthy food. And we invite you all to visit the portal for more information on corner stores and much more. The Healthy Food Access Portal harnesses a vast array of data and information to support the successful planning and implementation of policy, programs, and projects to improve access to healthy food. There's a number of resources on the portal around healthy corner stores, and here are just two examples. One is a healthy corner store initiative overview with key finding more information on the model. The corner store page on a retail strategy section of the portal. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. First off, we'll hear from Ana Ramos. She's been with the Food Trust since 2012 and started working with the Philadelphia Healthy Corner Store Initiative. In 2014, she was offered the opportunity to work with partners across the state of New Jersey to provide technical assistance and support for their Healthy Corner Store programs, as well as continue direct programming with the Camden, with the Camden Healthy Corner Store Network. She holds a Bachelor's of Business Administration from the Fox School of Business at Temple University and worked in her father's corner store as a teenager and is excited to continue working with corner stores to bring more healthy foods into our communities. And after that, we'll hear from Erin Healy. Erin oversees the Health Trust efforts to make healthy food, especially fruits and vegetables, available and affordable to vulnerable communities throughout Santa Clara and the northern San Benito counties. Erin Healy came to the food to the Health Trust in September 2013 from Miami, where she directed Youth Lead, the first food justice organization in South Florida. She served as Miami-Dade County Public Schools' first farm-to-school manager in 2011 and was selected as one of the 20 emerging leaders under 40 by the Miami Herald in 2011 and one, and one of Case Foundation's fearless leaders in 2012 for contributions to local food systems, policy change, and youth and community development programs in South Florida. And last but not least, we'll hear from Lindsay Smetana. Lindsay started her work with Tremont West Development Corporation in 2012. During her time, she worked primarily as a program manager of the Tremont Healthy Corner Store Initiative to bring fresh food produce to Tremont Corner Stores and develop educational programming focused on nutrition. Through her work as both a, a VISTA and in her current position, she has developed strong research, program development, and community outreach skills. She believes strongly in collective impact people can have on their communities and is passionate about working with residents to help them overcome challenges and build a great neighborhood. So we're so glad to have all of these speakers here today and we'll start our webinar off today hearing from Ana Rosmos. So hey everyone, thank you for joining this webinar. Like Cameron said, I will be discussing healthy corner store efforts in New Jersey. Um, to begin, I'll give you a bit of background and talk about why we are working with corner stores and bodegas. So corner stores, as we know, are a significant source of healthy food, a source of food for many families, especially families living in food or supermarket deserts. We also know from a study done by Temple University that 42% of Philadelphia students shop at their corner stores two times a day, and 50% of these students shop at corner stores at least once a day. So we really want children seeing things like bananas, yogurts, and grapes in the corner stores when they're going in to buy a snack. Corner stores and bodegas are small businesses, and by working with corner stores, we are supporting those local businesses and the neighborhoods that they're in. So what are the barriers to stocking fresh foods in corner stores? 
We know that stocking produce can be risky for store owners because they do not because the produce doesn't last as long as a canned item, for example. Many times infrastructure infrastructure and equipment limitations can be barriers as well to selling fresh produce. For example, a store owner might not have adequate refrigeration to stock the produce. Another barrier can be that store owners don't know where to source the produce, or they might have a perception that their customers that there isn't customer demand for the produce that they're trying to sell. So what is being done in New Jersey? Um, in 2014, the Food Trust, in partnership with the New Jersey Partnership for Healthy Kids, received a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to develop and expand a statewide healthy corner store initiative and to reach 150 stores by this December 2015. So we have this goal of expanding the initiative and reaching 150 stores by the end of the year, and to do that we have partnered with many organizations and stakeholders. The New Jersey Healthy Corner Store Initiative includes various components and involves many partners, and I will talk about them in the following slides. The Food Trust, the New Jersey Partnership for Healthy Kids, and the American Heart Association convened a multi-sector statewide tax task force to examine the needs facing store owners and communities and to identify strategies to increase the distribution, promotion, and sale of healthy products in New Jersey corner stores. The task force is, com is composed of a diverse group of leaders including corner store owners, food manufacturers and wholesalers, public health and community leaders, government officials, foundations, and others. The New Jersey Healthy Corner Store Task Force held four, held four meetings throughout 2014 and 2015 and included presentations from leadership from the New Jersey Department of Health, the USDA, the American Heart Association, distributor Jetro Cash and Carry, store, store owners, the Food Trust, and other community partners. The group also participated in discussions on a variety of topics including WIC vendor authorization, evaluation, and distribution challenges facing small stores. The task force also developed a list of recommendations that, I will, that will be published in a report this fall. So how is all of this work being done on the ground level? As you can imagine, there are many organizations working with bodegas and corner stores in New Jersey, and the Food Trust provides these organizations with many resources to help them establish and expand their networks of healthy corner stores. Through interactive training workshops, the Food Trust provides an opportunity for community partners involved in implementing healthy corner store projects to share successful strategies and build their capacity to work with store owners. Partners are also eligible to receive on-site support on a variety of program phases, including canvassing and recruiting corner stores, training store owners on how to sell, sell and stock fresh pro, um, healthy products, installing marketing materials, and conducting in-store nutrition education lessons. You will receive a link to the Food Trust website and can find more information on the faces of our programming there. Support is also customized and, and based on local needs and designed to build capacity while expanding the network, the network of healthy corner stores in New Jersey. Free marketing materials, including healthy recipe cards, signage to guide customers to healthy products, window decal, and toolkits tool kits for store owners are also available for partners and participating stores throughout the state. A mini-grant was, devel was developed to support local partners and corner stores during various phases of program development and to increase the store's capacity to sell fresh produce and other healthy foods. Mini-grants of up to $5,000 per city or $1,500 for individual stores were awarded in 2014 and 2015. The mini-grants were used for a wide range of healthy corner store programming components, including conversion equipment such as refrigeration, shelving or painting, or to refurbish equipment and for marketing campaigns. Um, the top picture that you see on your screen is an example of a produce rack that the Newark Healthy Corner Store Network refurbished with their mini grant funds. And the bottom picture um, is of a shelving and basket that the Violent Healthy Corner Store Network purchased for their participating store. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. Oh. 
Okay, here we go. So currently there are corner store efforts going on in 19 cities across the state of New Jersey. These corner store initiatives are at all levels of programming. Some are just starting to canvas their, canvas their communities and others have begun recruitment efforts. And some cities like Trenton and Newark have already provided member stores with equipment and are expanding their networks. This work in New Jersey could not have been as successful or grown as fast as it has without the support and continuous communication between all of the partners. New Jersey's American, American Heart Association's Voices for Healthy Kids campaign received a grant to advocate for state support for the New Jersey Healthy Corner Store Initiative. The American Heart Association is working closely with the Food Trust and the New Jersey Partnership for Healthy Kids to raise awareness of the need and impact of the statewide network and to make the case for policy change at the state level. While the statewide initiative was established in 2014, the Food Trust has been working with corner stores in Camden since, since 2011 through funding from the Campbell's Healthy Community Initiative. The Camden Healthy Corner Store Network ha has partnered with 39 stores and one concession stand and serves as a model for other communities across the state. Li lastly, we, we are partnered with the New Jersey Department of Health and New Jersey WIC. The New Jersey Department of Health and New Jersey WIC supported the Food Trust to provide healthy retail training for all New Jersey WIC vendors in 2014. The Department of Health is currently funding follow-up programming in 20 WIC stores. Ten of those stores received in-store nutrition education lessons and we'll, we will be enrolling an additional 20 store this year. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit and discuss the importance of partnering with WIC accepting stores. In New Jersey, WIC accepting vendors are required to stock at least four varieties of fresh produce items. WIC stores also carry other healthy items such as whole grains, low-fat dairy, products, and canned, canned items. And most importantly, some families that participate in the WIC program depend on their local corner store to make WIC purchases. Some of these families cannot travel to the supermarket to use their WIC vouchers, and we want to support WIC accepting corner stores and increase the variety of healthy products that expecting mothers and children need. This is why we encourage our stores to apply for WIC and why we are so excited to work with, to work with WIC accepting stores to increase our capacity to sell healthy foods. So now that you've had an overview of the New Jersey Healthy Corner Store Initiative, I want to talk about the cool innovative things that are happening on the ground across the state. In 2015, the Food Trust, with funding from the Community Foundation of South Jersey, piloted a Heartbucks program in 10 stores in Camden, New Jersey. Healthy Corner Stores received four four-week nutrition education series which covered topics such as fresh fruits and vegetables, fibers, and more. Customers that participated in these lessons received a free taste test which included recipes such as um, fruit and yogurt parfait, whole grain pizza, three bean salad, smoothies, and others depending on time of the lesson and the season. Customers who completed the lessons received four $1 Heartbuck coupons that can be used in the store to purchase heart-healthy items such as fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, lean protein, low-calorie snacks, and water. Um, Jorge Cava, I, I'm going to tell you a little story about a store owner. So Jorge Cava is the store owner of the New Village Supermarket in Camden, and he reported an 80% increase in the sale of fresh fruits and vegetables since joining the Camden Healthy Corner Store Network in January of 2015. Jorge once told me that customers really benefit from the Heartbook, Heartbucks coupons, and once they try the, the different fresh fruits and vegetables and purchase them with the Heartbucks, they continue purchasing these items. The Violent Healthy Food Network and the Camden Healthy Corner Store Network have both partnered with local health departments to provide free health screenings at participating he healthy corner stores. These efforts have just begun in New Jersey, but we are looking at the Philadelphia Heart Smarts program, which partners with Jefferson Hospital to provide free health screenings as a model to expand our screenings in corner stores throughout the state by partnering with hospitals. There is a lot going on in New Jersey, but we know that there is so much more work ahead of us and so many communities that need access to healthy foods. The New Jersey 
The New Jersey American Heart Association's Voices for Healthy Kids campaign has been working very hard throughout the year, and this June, a bipartisan group of legislators introduced the Healthy Small Food Retailer Act. This impactful legislation will set aside $1 million in state funds to enable the replication of local healthy corner store innovations and to bring them to a greater scale in other New Jersey communities that lack access to fresh, affordable foods. The New Jersey Healthy Corner Store Initiative will re release a report in early fall and will include a set of recommendations developed by the task force. The recommendations are about setting common evaluation metrics, wholesaler partnerships, healthcare partnerships, partnerships, and more. Finally, I would like to emphasize that this work could not have been possible without all of our partners and the amazing work going on in communities across the state. We have reached over 100 stores and have introduced over 500 new healthy products, and we are looking forward to continuing this work and reaching new communities. Hi everyone, um, I'm just trying to uh, advance the slide here. Here we go. Um, so I will start by saying, um, giving a little background on the Health Trust. We are an operating foundation, so we provide direct services as well as giving grants to local partners that directly implement programming. <clears throat> the Healthy Corner Store program fits within our Healthy Eating Initiative under our Good to Go campaign umbrella. The Health Trust works in Santa Clara County and northern San Benito County, both about an hour south and inland from San Francisco. We target San Jose's most impoverished communities that happen to also be food swamps. Most of the families we work with are Latino and most are immigrants. Because we are funding partners to saturate the target neighborhoods with healthy food outlets, we knew we needed to help the partners to generate consumer demand for the new products. We also knew behavior change takes time. For that reason, we hired a marketing firm, Salter Mitchell, to create our Good To Go brand that would increase customer recognition of the new outlets and drive consumer demand for the new products. Good To Go is different from the traditional public health model that typically educates people on what's healthy. The marketing firm found in their research that many people do know what's healthy, but they still make consumer and dietary choices based on taste, price, and convenience. Based on those findings and on the successes of the processed food industry marketing, good to go strives to appeal to customers' desires and needs, taste, convenience, a good feeling, and an affordable price. Therefore, good to go does not use health in its messaging, but rather promotes foods as, quote, fun, fast, and fresh. The fun should especially appeal to children, as we found that families are often coming to a corner store to give children treats. The emphasis on snacks not only appeals to children, but also to busy adults who don't have time to cook complicated meals. Salter Mitchell designed many different advertisements to build brand recognition and promote the healthy corner stores. Here are some pictures of billboards that were placed throughout the city near corner stores. There's an example of one side of a bus shelter that directs bus riders to the nearest healthy corner store. On the top right are recipe cards that we distribute in stores. And on the bottom right is a flyer with a coupon that's given out by canvassers who go door to door. The coupon gives customers $5 off of a $10 purchase for a good to go product only. Before I continue, I just want to take a moment to recognize our partners and also explain how we've divvied up the roles and responsibilities in this program. Because the Health Trust is an operating foundation, we often fund on-the-ground partners to implement direct programming. We provide technical assistance and oversight and coordination. The Food Trust is our main implementing partner and liaison with store owners. They provide training, technical assistance, equipment purchase and oversight, and store-level data tracking. Working Partnerships develops and conducts our community engagement components. Salter Mitchell, as I mentioned, is the marketing firm that helps uh, develop and print branded materials. Hispanic Chamber provides business-related training and technical assistance to stores. And we have a mobile farmer's market that's going to start doing some produce drop-offs at um, some of the corner stores. 
We have, called, of course, also work with our local public health department who has provided food demos and nutrition education at our stores. Our current model will recruit stores um, first to be, quote, members in development. So these stores will only become members once they've demonstrated certain criteria, um, such as introducing a minimum number of new products, um, meeting our product menu, putting up the advertisements in the correct way, et cetera. Member stores receive a free good-to-go snack rack. They receive marketing materials. And they have working partnerships coordinate a launch at their store. Flagship stores are one level up and receive more in addition for more commitment to the program. Flagship stores will receive refrigeration units, produce racks, assistance with permitting, oftentimes for a deli. They'll receive additional signage in the front of the store, such as awnings and street signs. We did tweak elements of the food trust model to meet our specific geographic and cultural landscape. So first, we require all stores to introduce a grab-and-go healthy snack item in addition to the healthy food items. We also restricted grams of sugar and prohibited items with high fructose corn syrup. We used the good-to-go me messaging, which I described earlier, is more of an advertising and marketing rather than a health or public health message. We did end up having to install a lot more marketing materials as we found that stores on the West Coast were often larger and had more space than the small bodegas in the Northeast. So we needed more of our marketing to really compete with the unhealthy advertising. And finally, we had to really develop a lot of solutions for produce distribution as this was found to be a huge challenge for our stores. The following few slides contain pictures to depict the main um, program strategies that we used. Following the food trust model, um, we found store owner training and technical assistance to be paramount. This includes working with the store owner to source, introduce, and place new healthy items in the store. The project staff helped change the layout of the stores to really promote and emphasize the new products. The pictures you see are before and after pictures for one of our flagship stores on the right. A large produce rack replaced an aisle and pastry cabinet is the first thing that you now see when you enter the store. Taking down that shelf allowed the customers to now see a refrigerator, which we branded and put healthy items in. On the left is a picture of a store owner that was receiving um, a certificate from the county and from an elected official's office. Recognition, we found, is really helpful. A lot of these store owners are taking huge risks. They're sometimes even losing money during the time that it takes to get consumers to shift their consumer habits. So it's really important to recognize their efforts. The bulk of the services offered to store owners is marketing and advertising, which helps to promote the new items. We used many different types of signage to do this. On the top right is a sticker that goes on refrigerators that contain healthy beverages. The middle top photo shows a sign that's put on top of the grab-and-go snack rack. The middle picture shows a decal that goes on windows or front doors. The bottom right shows uh, shelf tags that went under qualifying products. We also now have wobblers that pop out a little bit and attract more attention. And on the left is an example of a branded refrigerator that has the Good To Go um, branding and logo on it. Equipment such as refrigeration is provided free of charge so long as they only include Good To Go approved products in that refrigerator. All stores also receive a member banner to show that they're a member store. Here are some pictures specifically from our flagship stores, which, as I mentioned, receive more signage than the member stores. This store agreed to take down large Pepsi ads that were covering the whole front of the store and replace them with good-to-go signs. He had a lot of handwritten signs in the doors that we replaced with professionally designed and printed signs to highlight his deli. He's now receiving help to get a DEH permit to expand his deli so he can offer juices and smoothies and salads. The flags and A-frame sign were used at the launch event and are used consistently to tell customers about new promotions or products. We decided to have two murals painted on the flagship stores as part of the advertising campaign. And also, it, can, it really contributed to neighborhood beautification. Graffiti is often a problem around the stores, but we found that in San Jose, graffiti artists really respect mural artists and they won't tag over the murals. 
So we hired murals from the community to create culturally appropriate visuals, and we included um, translated taglines and a Mexican market scene to make sure that it connected with the community. As you all know, engaging the community is an essential part of this program. Changing customer eating and buying habits is incredibly challenging, and store owners are hesitant to, to continue to make inventory changes if they don't see people buying the new products. So the timing of introducing new products and promoting those products is really critical. Taste tests or food demos are a great way to get people to try new foods and learn new recipes, and also reframe their perspective of what a snack could be. For instance, a fruit salad instead of a candy bar. Engaging residents in the actual conversions of stores also helps increase community ownership. One important lesson we learned at the launch events is to make sure that every person who attended got a full tour of the store and had someone explain what the program was about and really highlight the new products. And we really explained to them that we can only continue this program with their support. We had a local Spanish radio station at two of our launches, and they provided bilingual educators and a lot of free giveaways. So that was a great partnership that we had that really drew a lot of attention to our store launches. Our program has ebbed and flowed over the year and a half since we started. Right now, we have two flagship stores, three member stores, and four stores in development. Five stores in total have received launch events at their stores, and over 800 residents have been reached through door-to-door -door outreach. The picture on the right is from our first main launch that was attended by the San Jose mayor on the left, a Google representative, the store owner in the middle, a county elected official on the right, and our CEO second from the right. As with any new strategy or pilot program, there are always many challenges and lessons learned. So I wanted to just take a moment to go through our lessons learned in hopes that it will help other programs around the country. First, we found that produce and healthy food distributors were very reluctant to work with our store owners. Our store owners just couldn't meet their minimum delivery requirements or sometimes even afford their prices. The Food Trust staff spent a lot of time researching local distributors and finding ways to get corner store owners to work together for distributors to make one bulk drop-off and then other core store owners to be able to pick up from that one drop-off. That helped reduce the delivery fee and the pricing, and it also helped to create a corner store network among the store owners. While the Food Trust was working on this, we found out later that store owners started to become motivated to look into this themselves. And so we actually ended up having even more distributors than we originally needed. So the store owners finally found a distributor that they like, and several of them all work with the same distributor. So that's worked out nicely. We also partner with another grantee of ours who's just launched a mobile farmer's market. And we're going to be pilot testing some bulk produce drop-offs at the corner stores. These produce drop-offs hopefully will also include gleaned produce from one of our partner organizations, Garden to Table. Second, timing and coordination among program pieces is key. Customer demand must be driven at the same time that products are introduced. Community partners or distribution partners must be engaged and used at the same time that store owners need the services. We launched our marketing campaign, but later realized that the stores just weren't ready and weren't presentable yet. So we ended up having to do multiple marketing campaign pushes as each store became ready. Third, setting realistic targets realistic targets is key. We realized that our original target of converting 40 stores over two years was much too ambitious, and we later rescoped the target to include only 10 stores per year. But this number should really depend on your capacity. Setting expectations at the beginning of the program really prevents confusion down the road. Being clear in writing by using MOUs, agreements, and store business plans that owners can sign off on are strategies for ensuring that everyone is on the same page. Because we were a pilot program, we made many changes in the first year, which confused owners and partners. Thankfully, the Food Trust introduced us to a, quote, change management process, through which we will meet quarterly to analyze and discuss any suggested changes before rolling them out to everyone. Fifth, the Food Trust introduced the concept of tiers based on store involvement. involvement. 
The stores and development phase really helped because it provided a few months of flexibility where store owners could really see if this was a good fit for them and program staff could see if the store was a good fit for the program. Once they prove their commitment, they're then pushed on to member stores and then member stores can really show their commitment and go above and beyond to become flagship stores over time. And finally, we learned a lot about recruitment. Based on our attrition from the first 30 stores that were recruited, and coming down to only having less than 10 at this point, we realized that we couldn't recruit stores that sold hard liquor anymore. It just wasn't a good fit for our program. We found that these stores relied too heavily on liquor for sales and ultimately just could not keep up with our program demands. And to close, I wanted to just give a special thanks to our funders, um, Google, USDA, City of San Jose, Leslie Family Foundation, and the Packard Foundation. I forgot to put a slide up here um, on our website, but our website is healthtrust.org. And if you click under Healthy Eating, you'll see all the information on our Good To Go campaign. We also have a Good To Go phone app that you can download on your Android or iPhone to find the nearest healthy corner stores near you. Thank you so much for that great overview. Um, and just as a reminder, keep those questions coming. Y'all are asking great questions, and we're going to have a couple minutes at the end um, to get to as many as we can. And next, we're going to hear from Lindsay. So, Lindsay, please take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining us today, and thank you to the organizers for uh, in, including the Tremont Corner Star Initiative project in, in the webinar. It's always great to be able to have the opportunity to share what we're doing and also to learn more about all the other great work that's going, that's being done around healthy retail. So to get started, I want to, uh, before I get into the Tremont Initiative, I would like to briefly outline the environment in Cleveland and give you an idea of what food insecurity looks like here. Um, as many of you may know, the, the USDA, uh, according to the USDA, census tracts qualify as food deserts if they have a poverty rate of 20% or higher and if at least a third of the population lives more than a mile from a grocery store in urban environments. Households are considered to be food insecure if at some point during the year they experience uh, uncertain availability of nutritional food or nutritious food. One out of two adults in Cleveland lives in a food desert and throughout Northeast Ohio, one in six people are food insecure and that goes up to one in five children uh, living in a food insecure household. Cuyahoga County had the highest number of food insecure residents in the state in 2013 and as you know, food insecurity contributes to obesity and the health problems that can accompany it and its effects can be seen in Cleveland's population. Nearly 36% of Cleveland residents are obese, which is higher than state and national statistics, and this is especially disconcerting when considering the fact that four of the 10 leading causes of preventable deaths in the U.S. are linked to diet. Annually, one out of three deaths in Cuyahoga County are due to heart disease. Over 3,000 people die from cancer a year in Cuyahoga County, and as of 2009, one in every eight Cleveland adults has diabetes. This, uh, these statistics demonstrate the need for a response to food insecurity in the community. Oh. Our initiative is focused on the Tremont area, which is a portion, it's a neighborhood in, in Cleveland. It's located southwest of downtown Cleveland, as you can see by the map there. It's near the Industrial Valley, and it started off as a steel town for those working in the valley. As with many Cleveland neighborhoods, Tremont struggled with the, consequ the consequences of population loss decades ago and also the more recent aftermath of the Great Recession. However, it has come back from that and has grown into an urban village with a diverse culture that has its roots in both its European heritage but also that's still being influenced by those who have made it home in more recent decades. It has a population of just under 8,000 people. It's mostly white. About a quarter of the population is uh, African American, and we also have a growing Latino population in Tremont. The Tremont Healthy Corner Store Initiative began in 2012 as a response to food insecurity in the Tremont neighborhood. 
Chimot lacks access to a full-service grocery store and has a poverty rate of 37%. Therefore, residents aren't spared from food insecurity and the health problems that accompany it. Nearly a third of Tremont residents are obese and therefore are at a higher risk of diet-related illnesses. The Tremont Healthy Corner Store Initiative offers a solution to food insecurity by working with neighborhood corner stores to increase access to affordable, healthy foods. We have received funding uh, from a number of sources, and I've listed them there, uh, including the Cleveland Foundation, ArcelorMittal, the City of Cleveland, Enterprise Community Partners, the Thatcher Family Fund through the Cleveland Foundation, and Dollar Bank. We developed our model based on what other cities have done, including the Cleveland Corner Store project of a few years ago. We wanted to research best practices around initiatives like this, and that's how we built up the program that we have today. We have three main goals, which I've listed there. We, uh, including work with a minimum of five locations to bring fresh produce to their stores, increase community members' knowledge of the benefits of healthy eating and how to eat healthy as a way to increase consumption of healthier foods, and finally, improve perceptions of Tremont stores by making them reliable shopping locations that offer a consistent selection of healthy foods. Regarding the first goal, we have provided five neighborhood corner stores with upgrades, including produce coolers, corner store kits, sell healthy guides for the owners to help them learn how to market and sell fresh produce, and also promotional materials. That image there on the left is part of our one of our promotional materials. It's a postcard that lists the locations that are currently involved. So we have five locations. We have connected store owners with distribution sources when necessary and provide technical assistance, including regular site fits to the store to make sure that things are going smoothly um, in the stores with the owners. They are required to offer three varieties each of fresh fruits and vegetables, and they are also allowed to include other healthy products that we um, permit, such as sandwiches, hummus, 100% juice, uh, salads, things like that. Regarding the second goal, we have worked with a variety of community partners to create free educational programming for the community, and this is a way to help consumers learn about how to eat healthy. This programming includes healthy cooking demonstrations, a healthy living book display at a local library branch, and we've also hosted two events at corner stores and organized a healthy harvest event for kids on food day last fall that was a trick-or-treat theme scavenger hunt that got them to go around to different neighborhood um, businesses and try healthy foods and activities. We've also created educational materials, including a healthy eating guide, uh, suggested shopping lists, uh, tip sheets, and other things like that that we distribute at events and in the stores. Regarding the third goal, we work with store owners to try to get them to reduce alcohol and tobacco advertising in their establishments, and we've seen some success with this goal. We've had stores show interest in additional investments beyond the corner store cooler that we provide them. For example, there is a city loans program for physical improvements, and one store is interested in pursuing this. Uh, furthermore, through the work that we've done around the first two goals, we're also contributing to improved perceptions of the stores by bringing new healthy products into them and making sure they are offered consistently. While we weren't met with very strong reluctance on the part of the store owners when we first approached them, we, we did have some, some initial challenges that we needed to overcome when implementing the program. Um, and we had to work to help overcome hesitation that they had. And this is actually an example of one of the unique partnerships that was formed out of this project. We worked with a local councilman by the name of Joe Simperman, who is a big proponent of health initiatives in Cleveland. And he connected us with Pierre Bajani, the president of the Cleveland American Middle Eastern Organization. All of the store owners that we approached for the first round of stores and many store owners in the city of Cleveland are Middle Eastern American. And Mr. Bajani, who is pictured there uh, in, the, in the graphic of the article I have on the left of the page, he 
um, went and reached out to the store owners on our behalf to show his support for this initiative and help them understand how important it was to invest this in their community. And because of this, those who had been reluctant felt more comfortable working with us. And Mr. Bajani has continued to, to stay in contact with the initiative. He comes to our events to keep himself aware of what's going on. And he's um, visited the stores. As you can see, they featured him in an article on one of those visits just as he was following up regularly with the stores. After overcoming initial hurdles, it has still taken continued partnerships for the initiative to keep going, and it wouldn't be able to succeed without the support of the store owners and residents and also the multiple organizations that have been involved. And as you can see, we've worked with an extensive list of partners that have provided a range of resources varying from financing to collaboration on events. We are happy to be able to share the successes that we've seen so far since the launch in spring of 2014. Uh, we launched at three stores, and since then we've expanded to two additional locations, and we're still looking to add more. The successes that we've seen both in the stores and at events speak to the efficacy of this project. The stores have gone above our expectations and offer more than the required amount of fruits and, fruits and vegetables. Many have brought in other healthy options like I mentioned earlier, the salad, sandwiches, um, other value-added products, things like that. One even um, brings in or makes hummus homemade in the store and sells it out of their cooler. They've also made it easy to locate the coolers by placing them near the entrance and checkout areas of the store. Some have cleared signage off the windows, which have been, has improved visibility into the store and also reduces uh, tobacco and alcohol advertising for all customer, all consumers, but also ones that are that are younger. We also had strong attendance at our educational events. We've had around 100 total residents come out to our two launches at the stores, and at those events they had access to information on healthy eating, active living, free health screenings, um, healthy prizes, and healthy food samples. We've also hosted six free healthy cooking demonstrations and have had about 10 to 20 participants at each. And we have one more scheduled for this year. And with the cooking demonstrations, we do try to accommodate different dietary needs and different populations in the neighborhood. We've had uh, a local catering company called Cleveland Vegan come out to do a couple cooking demos for those who are vegan. And we also have two demonstrations. The last two that we're hosting are hosted in both Spanish and English, so we are able to bring that into the into educational programming. We, As I mentioned briefly, we also hosted the event for kids last fall in partnership with neighborhood businesses, and we had around 30 kids come out from the community to join us for that. This programming not only helps the community learn about how to eat healthy, it also connects them to the work that we're doing, and it gives them a chance to engage with us and the project and also inform us about the program from their perspective. And we will continue offering this, this programming moving forward because it is vital to the success of the initiative. So we've had a, a, a good first year. Um, I think it's a great first year. And moving forward, we'll be working on expanding the program. There is other work that is starting around healthy retail access in other parts of the city. And it is exciting to see that others are recognizing that this still works as part of a response to food insecurity. For example, the Health Improvement Partnership of Cuyahoga County, um, which is a countywide consortium of over 100 community partners um, recently received funding through the CDC to implement a program on the east side of the city and also um, East Cleveland. And this includes a healthy retail component that will expand the Healthy Corner Store Network in Cleveland. And this grant provides Tremont West with the great opportunity to work more comprehensively and broaden the scope of this project through this new partnership. And we are excited to be involved with that and look forward to continuing our work and seeing what else everyone else is doing. So uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and now we're going to open up the floor to questions. And thanks again to everyone who's been sending in great questions. And please continue to do so um, during our Q&A time. And our first question, which goes to any one of our panelists, is, 
In your experience, what do you find that store owners find the most beneficial when joining a Healthy Corner Store network? And that goes to any panelists or even multiple panelists. Uh, I think this is, oh, go ahead, Erin. <laughs> Sorry. No, you um, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, one thing that I think was helpful that we did that they told us they appreciated is when we asked them to buy a new um, order of fruits and vegetables, they were very concerned that it wasn't going to sell. So what we offered to them was that we would pay them back for their losses. And so in that way, um, we took out the risk factor and we just built it into our budget. Of course, we don't do this on an ongoing basis, um, but I think we did it uh, twice. Um, so the first and second times that they ordered a big shipment of produce, we offered to, to cut their losses. Hi everyone, this is Anna Ramos. Um, our store owners will often say that they find the nutrition education lessons very, very beneficial because we are educating the customers and a lot of times people are going into the stores quickly and they may not know that the store is making healthy changes. Um, so talking to the customers and giving them a tour of the store and highlighting I items that are canned but maybe they're um, in light syrup or in 100% juice. Um, so talking to the customers and highlighting the new items that they've introduced and also um, the free equipment is very, very beneficial because like I said in my slide, a lot of store owners don't have um, adequate refrigeration to stock healthy foods or fresh produce. Um, yeah, and then with the, the Tremont initiative, we initially what, what attracted them I think was that we um, tried to make it hard for them to say no by offering larger incentives like the coolers um, and at first with the store owners it may have been about th about being able to offer this new product without a huge risk they wouldn't have to invest the money f to, to store it properly and it, uh, it would also be an investment in their store um, in general and that was one of the initial reasons that I think their ears perked up but also now it has grown to something that is that is beyond that. A lot of them, when you talk to them now, they recognize that it's important to have this offered in the community, and they talk about how they keep things that certain customers want to see in the stores for them, and, and they realize that benefit to not just their business, but also the community itself, which is which is a great thing to see now. Thank you so much. And um, our next question is a really great question. Um, this is again for any of one of our presenters. Most of these programs start as pilots. How long did it take your program to get to the point you presented today from its first iteration? This is Anna Ramos. Um, so while the New Jersey Healthy Corner Store initiative started in 2014, there was already a lot of work going on in the ground way before that. The Camden Healthy Corner Store Network, for example, started in 2011, and we set a goal of adding 10 stores per year. Um, so that's how we reached 39 stores and one concession stand in, in Camden. Was It was adding um, a few amount of stores every year. Um, to get to the point from recruiting a store to a store making a healthy change to adding healthy products can take anywhere from um, a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Uh, and this is uh, Lindsay from Tremont. So as I mentioned, the groundwork for our initiative began in 2012, but we launched in 2014. So there were a couple of years of work on my part to get the program planned and things like that. We do have a smaller initiative which um, allows us a little more direct contact with the stores because we're focused on such a small geographical area and we only have a certain number of stores so we have um, actually we're in almost all of the stores in the Tremont neighborhood and and um, so it's taken us since the launch of last year to do that but uh, but we are continuing to grow still so I wouldn't say that we're necessarily you know we're, I think that we're still in the pilot it's turning into a, a two-year pilot um, but but it uh, so it took us from last year, the, the launch last year, to get to where we're at. This is Erin from the Health Trust. Uh, we've been going for about a year and a half, and I would also say that we're probably looking at a two-year pilot. Um, I think it, we're just still rising 
strategies and marketing materials and still thinking about what would work best. Our stores, um, the main stores that started, it's been about one year since they've been um, in the program. And I would say a couple of them are just now starting to do well and sustain some of these strategies. So I would say at the store level, probably a year, but it, it really depends on um, the neighborhood, the store owners, what types of funding and support, and how much capacity the, the project team has. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for sharing. I think we have a good um, good range of of scope and size um, about our healthy corn healthy corner store networks um, on the webinar today. And our next question is actually uh, directed towards Aaron. Um, for the health, uh, excuse me, what did on the ground staffing look like, and how time sensitive was it? And did you have any community based partners other than the stores? Yes, so I had um, a slide where we listed all of our partners in the different roles. So we have one grantee partner, Working Partnerships, that is focused on the community engagement component. Um, within that grantee partner, they have a part-time director, a full-time outreach manager, and then a team of canvassers that go door to door. So that's a pretty hefty community engagement team. Um, I know of all the programs I've talked to, there's at least one full-time person that's usually devoted to community outreach. And then we have, um, right now, it's the Food Trust, who is the implementing partner. Right now, there's a full-time um, program manager, and they are hiring a full-time program associate. And we also um, talk with a director in the Philadelphia office who's part-time on that project. Um, there, at the Health Trust, there's myself and the um, Healthy Eating Program Associate. So we both probably give about 15 to 25% of our time on this program. We all meet together monthly, and we have lots of emails and phone calls in between as well. Um, and then we have a quarterly meeting with everyone, including the leadership here at the Health Trust. Thanks, Erin. Um, and the next question is going to come to, uh, going to go to any one of the presenters. Um, this is also, <clears throat> we've received different um, forms of this question, so it's kind of a common theme. How do you address affordability issues commonly associated with fresh foods? I'll jump in first. This is Erin from the Health Trust. This was a huge issue for us, and we actually recruited and hired a consultant to help us really understand pricing. Um, we did some surveys among the community to try to get an, an estimation of what people were willing to pay for both imported produce and local fresh produce. Um, he also crunched numbers and tried to find the top and bottom lines um, of affordability for customers based on just what was out there and what people were currently paying at the corner stores. And then he also looked at the profit and loss sheets for each of our partners to understand how much they would have to charge to break even and then to make a profit. And we're still talking about a lot of that. So it, it's been taking a while to figure that out. And I think it's an ongoing process of testing out different prices and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't. We did find that there were a couple of items such as oranges where, where everyone seemed to be underselling and people were actually willing to pay more. Um, so it was good to really look at each uh, produce type or each crop type to see where we could finagle the pricing a little bit. Um, we also do a lot of bundling. So our um, partner, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, works with the store owners to figure out what two to three pro products could go together for a recipe and then bundles them and puts a coupon on them. So people get $5 off of a $10 purchase if they buy a bundle of good-to-go products, and that's been working out really well if it's built into the budget so that corner store owners can get reimbursed for the coupons that are redeemed. Hi, this is Lindsay. Um, so hey, everyone. This is Anna Ramos. Go ahead, Anna. Hey, everyone. So um, what we have been doing here at the Food Trust is really trying to find new sourcing channels and new distributors um, that sell healthy 
or fresh produce, um, maybe in smaller quantities that store owners can afford, um, because sometimes what will happen is that store owners have to buy a large quantity of something and then it goes bad and they don't want to risk it, so they'll sometimes sometimes try to bump up the price a little bit to offweigh the cost of losing some produce. Um, but if they can find smaller quantity of boxes, um, they can sell it at a lower cost to their, their customers if they find it um, very well priced. So we're constantly looking for new distributors and connecting them to the store owners. We, are, we have also been educating store owners on the seasonality of produce, so just giving them an overview of what's in season in New Jersey when, um, and when you know when they can promote apples in the fall or watermelons in the in the summertime, um, and we have also been working with um, trying to get store owners to sell value-added products like fruit salads, um, because if a store owner buys produce and the produce starts going bad, then they can chop it up and make it into a fruit salad and still make money off of that. Um, and they won't have that risk of the produce going bad and them them having to bump up their price. Um, and lastly, through our Heart Bucks programs, we are providing incentives for corner, for customers so that they can um, start tasting new products and and then hopefully begin um, purchasing those he healthy fresh foods. And then uh, with Tremont, we do want the prices to be competitive. Um, with the stores, it it does still they are competitive, but it depends on what item you're looking at. For starting off, we tried to cut the cost that we were going to be passing on to consumers by lowering it on the distribution end, and we we did offer um, to help set them up with a kind of a purchasing co-op with a large wholesaler and offer them a stipend if they did go through the wholesale distributor that we chose, that we actually found that stores preferred to still go to retailers because they felt that it was more affordable um, for the stuff that they were looking for, and we aren't going to, we don't dictate where they get their produce from as long as it's a good quality. So they, they have, most of them have gone that avenue, um, but we do work with them in the stores to try to offer ways to cut other costs. Um, we have coupons that the stores accept. Um, they, do de they do some specials, like a lot of them have delis, so if someone buys a deli sandwich, then they can get a, piece, a whole piece of fruit or a fruit salad for a reduced cost. We also have an appreciation, kind of a customer appreciation at one of the stores that's across the street from a larger company. Um, so anybody who, from that company who has their uniform on can go into the store and they'll get um, a reduced product, I guess, out of the cooler, um, a piece of fruit, things like that. Um, the Sell Healthy Guide that we distribute also has suggestions on on what to sell and when to sell it, and as Anna mentioned, value-added techniques and things like that. Thanks so much, Lindsay and Anna. Um, and now our time together is coming to a close, um, but since we didn't get to answer everyone's questions, if you do have additional questions, please follow up to today's discussion. You can submit them through the um, through either the survey that we're going to send after this or through the portal contact form. So I just want to say thank you again to Anna, Aaron, and Lindsay for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, thank you to all of you who have, been, who have joined us in this webinar. And again, the slide presentation will be available on the portal website and you'll get an email um, after this webinar is complete. Um, so please everyone have a great afternoon and have a great day.